If you were to look at the way that we Catholics define doctrine, pray, and structure our church, you are bound to find innumerable ways that we are different from Protestants. Catholics believe that sanctifying works are integral to salvation, whereas Protestants believe that it's up to faith alone. Catholics celebrate the Eucharist because Christ is sacramentally present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, whereas Protestants view it as a symbolic act. Catholics look to Rome for guidance in matters of faith and morals, whereas Protestants look to Rome for good gelato. And while all of this is true, and one can certainly learn all the many ways that we're different, it raises a far more interesting question. Why do these two traditions differ? What is the underlying spirit of Catholicism, distinct from Protestantism, that informs what we believe, how we pray, and why we remain Catholic? This is Catholicism in Focus. Right off the bat, we need to make two points very clear. First, there is no such thing, practically speaking, as Protestantism. There are church traditions that protested against the Catholic Church in the 16th century, yes, and these traditions can be loosely lumped together on a variety of issues. But there is no uniform, essential spirit that unites them all. Any attempt to define Protestant theology will always have exceptions. Second, while there is definitely a more unified spirit to Catholicism, that doesn't mean that we're monolithic either. With 23 rites within the church spanning 2,000 years, there is pluralism in our theology that resists narrow categorizations. There is no such thing as a singular list of principles or theological pillars to thinking like a Catholic, and so any suggestions in this regard are meant to be reflective, not authoritative teaching. You can disagree with, expand upon, or adapt what I say. Got it? Great. In the introduction to his book, Catholicism, Richard McBrien suggests that there are three core principles that define the spirit of the Catholic faith. The first is that of sacramentality. As Catholics, we know that we believe in the sacraments, the seven visible signs of God's invisible grace. Many of us probably take this for granted. But beneath this belief is something quite extraordinary. In order for God to be present in these seven ordinary objects and rituals, we must first accept that it's even possible for an infinite God to be contained by time and space. The foundation for this belief is, of course, the Incarnation, Jesus Christ, a being that was fully God and fully man, the Word made flesh. All Christians accept this. For Catholics, though, the existence of the Incarnation points to the fact that God is capable, and so chooses, to make God's spiritual presence known in the material world. Rather than a created world in which God remains far off and infinitely separate, intervening in rare and extraordinary circumstances, Catholics understand that all of creation is graced by God's presence. It's from this foundation that we accept the sacraments, but it's also why we have a fairly positive view of creation as well. Everything that God created, including our human nature, is inherently good because it was created, redeemed, sustained, and nurtured by God. It exists because God's grace is present in it. This is a major divergence from the classical Protestant worldview, which has tended to focus much more attention on the complete otherness and transcendence of God. God is above and we are below. Thus, the created world, which is given to us for our use, is not seen to have any direct connection to God or bear any inherent goodness. Some Protestants do have sacramental traditions, but they're generally viewed as an exception to nature, standing against it. In the Eucharist, for example, Lutherans believe that Christ's presence exists next to or with bread and wine, whereas Catholics believe that Christ actually transforms these elements and is revealed through them. Why does God interact with the world in such a substantial way? Catholics suggest it's for the sake of the second principle, mediation. While Protestants have traditionally recognized that a sacrament signifies the work of God, allowing for an encounter with God on the level of memory or consciousness, Catholics contend that it also causes what it signifies. More than just a reflective experience for a person of faith, sacraments actually effect the very grace of God in the material world. The idea of mediation for Catholics suggests that God is not only sacramentally present, but accessible as well. God enters the material world not simply to be seen or remembered, as if for some spectacular vision of wonder. No, God enters the material world so that we can truly encounter Him and be changed by the experience. Baptism does not simply remind us that Jesus died for our sins. It actually takes them away and grafts us to him in his death and resurrection. 
The Eucharist does not simply signify that we are in communion with Jesus and one another. It fundamentally binds us together in Christ, who is truly present. In other words, the material world mediates the presence of God so that we can physically see, touch, smell, hear, and taste an infinite, immaterial God. That is incredible. For Catholics, this sense of mediating God's presence extends far beyond inanimate objects and includes, quite significantly, the person of the minister. Whereas most Protestants view their minister as a teacher, qualified to instruct and guide, but ultimately no closer to God than those they serve, Catholics view their ordained clergy as fundamentally mediators of God's grace. When bishops, priests, and deacons celebrate the sacraments, God's actual presence is made manifest in the objects they bless, but even in their very selves. When bishops and priests celebrate the Eucharist, they do so in the person of Christ, speaking his words and making him present through their actions. It's for this same reason that Catholics also tend to have a much higher appreciation for Mary than do Protestants, venerating her for her role in mediating the presence of God in the most fundamental way ever experienced. It was because of her free choice that God was able to become incarnate. And it is because of this incarnation that the third and final defining principle of the Catholic faith was made possible, that of communion. Ultimately, the reason that God sought to enter the world and mediate his presence to us was so that we might share in God's infinite divine life. It was not enough to remain separate, witnessing one another from afar. God wished to be one in love with what he created. This communion with God was never intended as a personal relationship between God and each of us individually, but rather one shared with all of humanity and really all of creation. For Catholics, the church is more than just a social club of like-minded individuals, an optional tool for Christians to network and help each other out as needed. No, the church is the sacrament of salvation, the institutional mark of God's mediation on earth and living embodiment of communion with God. We join the church, not because we want to get into heaven, but because it is a foretaste of heaven in our midst. A people, one in mind and heart, brought together to love and serve the Lord and one another. Those who have been washed clean in baptism don't simply hold a membership card and they can't decide one day to opt out. Through this sacrament of mediation, the faithful are eternally bound to one another, in communion with other Christians here on earth as well as those saints in heaven. It is this sense of the church, one of a heavenly institution existing on earth and being led by human beings, that we witness the most dynamic example of the convergence of sacramentality, mediation, and communion on earth. For this reason, McBrien calls it the heart of the distinctively Catholic understanding and practice of Christian faith. If you want to be Catholic to the core, this is how you need to approach the world. Now, are these the only important principles to understanding Catholicism? Of course not. But they do serve as the foundation for everything else. McBrien suggests that there are at least four other points worth noting, all of which flow from and help guide this core Catholic worldview. Chief among them is the sense of tradition. God doesn't just enter our world and seek communion with us today, but has been present all throughout history. Thus, if there was a way of approaching an issue, praying, or living the faith that brought people closer to God in the past, it only makes sense that we maintain a sense of continuity with our mothers and fathers of faith. Because we believe that God can be known and experienced through the created world, and since we have a fairly optimistic approach to the human person, Catholics tend to place a lot of trust in our faculty to reason. Philosophy, science, mathematics, art, history, all of the many disciplines of higher learning can teach us more about God and lead us to greater communion, and so should be approached with the same vigor that we read scripture and engage in prayer, which ultimately will allow us to further encounter God in the world, ourselves, and in Jesus Christ, leaving us confident in our ability to speak about God analogically, as opposed to a dialectical approach that emphasizes the uniqueness and otherness of God, often employed by Protestants, Catholics recognize a fundamental continuity between our existence and God's and thus seek to find similarity in difference. And finally, as the name Catholic suggests, there is always a sense of universality to our faith, that God's work for communion is mediated by time, place, culture, and language, but that it's not beholden to any of these things. The truth of Catholicism is inclusive to all peoples of all times, leading us back to our core a desire to be in communion with all. Which is, I think, the real beauty of these principles. From just these three concepts, sacramentality, mediation, and communion, we can see everything that matters to us Catholics fitting together. 
from the Eucharist to social justice, the indissolubility of marriage to the preferential option for the poor, even our doctrines of anthropology, soteriology, and eschatology, they all lead us back to the fundamental principles that inform our faith. But maybe even more important than defining who we are, these principles help us to understand and relate to those who are different from us. More than simply understanding the individual doctrinal differences that separate Christian traditions, the fact that we disagree, knowing why we believe what we do, knowing the core spirit that informs our faith, will help us to understand why others disagree with us. Simply put, their foundational beliefs and guiding principles are different from ours. The sacraments make so much sense to us as Catholics, but if you don't have a sacramental worldview, they might come off a bit like idolatry. The assurance of having an ordained minister capable of affecting God's presence in our midst is a wonderful blessing for us, but without a strong sense of mediation, it might sound a bit like magic. The Church as a mystical body headed by Christ's vicar on earth seems perfectly normal to us, but without the sense of communion that we share, it might feel a bit like oppressive collectivism, not to mention it's going to be difficult to accept in the face of scandals. We know, of course, that none of these things are true, but it's because we're able to grasp the spirit of our faith, the underlying principles that inform what we believe and do, that we're able to understand why someone might think this about us, and more importantly, be able to explain to them why we hold something to be true. For me, this is when the real conversation begins. We can debate until our faces turn blue, the doctrine of this or that, quoting scripture at one another and trying to convince the other that they're wrong. But it's only when we're able to get to the core, identifying what's behind our arguments, what we're trying to accomplish and what we want to avoid, that we can truly understand each other and maybe even change some hearts.